as Nigerians prepare ahead for the 2023 elections, concerned citizens and elder statesmen are speaking up about rescuing the country from economic and political degradation, most especially regarding Nigeria's restructuring and the options available. Joining us now is Professor Ladiko Adamolekun, a professor of public administration and former international staff of the World Bank, who recently turned 80. Good morning, Prof, and thank you very much for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning, Ruben. Congratulations on your recent uh, birthday. <laughs> thank you, sir. Well, and congratulations also to you on your 80th uh, birthday in July and the publication of your autobiography, I Remember. Now, Nigeria is going through another round thank, of transition. And uh, we are all, this morning we've been talking about the 2023 uh, general elections and the politicians. Uh, what do you think is the missing link in this entire political uh, process? And what should we be more concerned about as Nigeria moves towards uh, that transition in 2023? Uh, I'm a believer in Nigeria as a genuine, some say, true federation. In 2005, I said that without devolution, Nigeria would not function properly. Uh, and in my uh, Nigerian eye, uh, getting politics right to make Nigeria work, I made four recommendations. And one of them, relevant to what we are saying, is that a devolved federation is a necessity, not a choice. I will give just one example. There is no federation in the world where you list local governments. And Nigeria has its 774 local governments listed. Those 774 local governments are inventions of the military. Local governments are subordinate jurisdictions of subnational governments in all federations. So to actually develop, develop, get Nigeria to work, those, that listing should be expunged in any, I mean, in a meaningful revision of that constitution, and local governments should be subordinate jurisdictions of uh, uh, of the subnational governments. Of course, that's just one element, but a major element is our very, very faulty or skewed revenue allocation. Somebody says, actually it's not somebody, the president says, you cannot have state police because states cannot finance them. Now, <laughs> when your revenue allocation formula is distorted, State governments are deprived of the funds that should be theirs, and they cannot fund police. But we need state police, and revenue allocation should be 60% to subnational governments and 40 to the central government. All right. Thank you, Professor Adam Oleko. It's an, it's an honor to have you on the show this morning because it's for us to move this great nation, Nigeria, forward, we must lean on the experience and wisdom of elder statesmen like yourself. You have talked about getting politics right in order to, um, to necessitate a Nigeria that works. In your monograph, you talk about how Nigeria can work, and you refer to your time, you know, when Nigeria worked at least better than it is now. What are some of the recommendations beyond, as you've mentioned just a few seconds ago, the devolution of powers to a true federation? What are some of the other recommendations you'd make for in Nigeria to truly work, that truly works? Thank you very much. Uh, besides the devolved federal system, I also say that, uh, I also recommend that Good democratic practice is essential to make Nigeria work. And by that I mean a genuine enforcement of the rule of law, respect of, for human rights. Because when you respect human individual rights, you are not only setting, uh, getting citizens involved, but the law that protects human rights is the same law 
that helps to ensure uh, enforcement of property rights. Uh, there is evidence, or it is demonstrated, that uh, effective uh, rule of law helps economic development, just as it enhances the participation of citizens uh, in governance. Uh, the third recommendation I made is uh, the need for administrative competence. Both at the federal and state levels, governments complain of weak implementation capacity. Indeed, uh, what I will call uh, the president's lamentation in his October 1st speech, saying that the federal civil service was weak. Now, <laughs> it's at the beginning of uh, a government's uh, uh, rule that it should focus attention on ensuring competent, uh, uh, competent civil service, not in the seventh year, or at the beginning of the seventh year of, a, of an eight-year uh, rule. Um, there is an example in the country, for instance, of how administrative competence made possible the giant development strikes in Western Nigeria in the 50s to the point that the uh, outgoing premier of Western Nigeria in 1954 claimed that all the achievements were made possible to a considerable extent by the competence of the uh, civil service. Universal primary education, uh, first television in Africa, uh, first TV, all of those achievements of Western Nigeria, not just uh, the current Southwest, most of South South were part of that Southwest that benefited administrative competence was a key. Uh, the other uh, uh, regions at the time also enjoyed administrative competence. So nationally, poverty level was just around 25% uh, by the mid-60s. Today, it is 63%. And uh, recently, it was a question of, is it the fault of the federal government or the fault of some national government? It is very clear. <laughs> it is the fault of both levels of government, but as I've said, an over-centralized federation weakens the subnational government. And uh, I think that's the, that's the demonstration of what administrative competence can do and what the lack of administrative competence uh, uh, gives to you. Uh, an incompetent, uh, or rather a non-functioning, poor performing uh, governmental system. Okay, sir. Real quickly, all of this you said, they all sound right. The reason why we have administrative, or why we had administrative competence during the Western region of the 50s was because you had the larger than life intellectual warehouse leader called Obafemi Awolowo. In the East, you had Anamdi Azikiwe. In the North, you had a Saldana. Or well, you cannot juxtapose that with the kind of leadership we have today. The leadership system, where predominantly you have thugs and all sorts of people with questionable character leading our country. Today, our leadership system selection process has become a pantomime. How do we get our leadership selection process right? Thank you very much. Uh, you remind me of my fourth recommendation which is uh, the need for development-oriented political leadership. And by that I mean a leader who focuses on growing the economy, reducing poverty, assuring security, and moving the country towards prosperity for all the citizens. That is the meaning of a development-oriented leadership. And I also uh, provided four, character, four key characteristics, there will be others, intelligence, integrity, competence, and vision. You are quite right that if you look at the attributes of political leadership that I identify as desirable, those leaders you mentioned combined, well, I won't say most of them, but some of them, and that these days now, uh, if you take uh, integrity and competence, for instance, or even vision, because we must, for instance, uh, Abiola's vision was uh, make poverty history. Our vision was 
uh, life more abundant for all, which is the prosperity I talked about. So we do have examples of what good leadership is. Uh, how do we ensure that our system produces good leaders? That's a very, very tough one. But I can tell you, the party system that is enshrined in the Constitution does not help us at all. Many of the provisions in Nigeria's 1999 Constitution on political parties deserve to be totally expunged. Apart from asking parties to align with the, uh, uh, the guiding, guiding policy principles stated in the Constitution, which I agree with, a constitution has no basis for saying parties should be all over the country, uh, how their finances should be run. The result is that we do not have a viable political system because there is nobody who can emerge as leader within the context of the current constitution without going through uh, our party system. And as I've said, our party system is fundamentally weak. So between now and 2023, you cannot get that sorted out. Uh, which leads me to make the point that if you maintain the current constitution, whoever emerges as the uh, president, unless he, he accepts, like the year I do, I did, the process that brought me to power is faulty, and is set up uh, 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 <clears throat> an electoral review commission. The results are out. They've not been implemented to date. And that's part of why we're where we are, uh, where we're in this trouble. What I'm trying to say is that the first thing to get Nigeria, to get politics right, is the change of our basic law. The basic law we have cannot take us to that promised land of a Nigeria that works. And uh, I've given some examples, revenue allocation, and I've also talked about, uh, <clears throat> about uh, the party system, that the provisions in the Constitution should be expunged, other than align parties. Why, why shouldn't somebody aspire to govern a state? Why shouldn't a party aspire to govern a state? And you will then have parties that are national and parties that are either state-oriented or zona oriented That's the way it will work. The current system of producing leaders through parties that must be everywhere in the Federation leads to the kind of uh, political leaders that you have described. So really, uh, my answer to your question is fundamental. That is, our basic law leads uh, the defects of our basic law lead part of the defects, especially those leading to political parties that have to produce the uh, leaders, uh, have to be expunged. And uh, the, 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 the leader you get in, uh, or rather we get <laughs> in, in 2023 uh, but will not answer that your, your question. Well, prof. But that leader needs to admit, yes, well, we're trying to wrap this up uh, very quickly. You've said a lot of things, but just two quick uh, questions. One, public administration. You've written extensively on this. Given our present situation in Nigeria, is there a future, really, for public administration in Nigeria? As far back as, that's the second one now, as far back as 1985, you said the university system in Nigeria had been overtaken by mediocrity. When you look at the system today, how do you feel? Because if you said mediocrity had taken over the system in 1985, what is it that has taken over now? Will you define it as a tragedy? Thank you very much for your two, two questions. I will answer them very, very clearly. On public administration, again, it was the Yaradu administration that wanted or requested DFID to help with uh, a world, how Nigeria can achieve a world-class civil service. I led a team of international experts together with Nigerian, uh, top Nigerian civil servants to produce uh, a national strategy. I can tell you from experience in the, from the World Bank, that strategy of 
public service uh, that work, that will work, and that will lead us uh, in the direction of our objectives, that strategy will compare with any strategy anywhere in the third world, even in, develop, in developed countries. But it was put on the shelves till today. Only small aspects have been implemented. So public administration is critical. A president recognized that a strategy was uh, produced, implementation was lacking. That is a very clear answer to your question. In other words, if we want to get competent administration, we know what to do, we know what is required, let them implement the strategy there. Of course, it will be updated and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and modified. Improvement is too strong <laughs> in, in that context. Your second question, again, is one that touches me very, very much because I spent most of my life in, uh, in the educational system in this country at the tertiary level. And because I was concerned, again, I produced uh, uh, a recommendation on the need to establish and nurture Nigeria's elite universities. Nigeria cannot be economically competitive uh, by year 2030 if we do not set the process in motion. Almost immediately, in fact, since 2018 when I made that recommendation, to at least begin, I mean, at least uh, identify, select six elite universities, one each from the geopolitical zones. Uh, that's not federal character, it is doable. And some of those universities are self-selected. ABU uh, from Northwest, Ibadan from uh, Southwest, Usuka from Southeast. Let universities compete for the uh, three other zones. And those universities should not have anything to do with ASU, and their vice chancellors should be selected. I, okay, I cannot give the details in this answer to your question, but I can refer you to that document, which actually I discussed with the vice president who was interested. Again, it has not, the implementation it has not uh, gained traction and it has not been implemented. So for some reason, you have touched on two, <laughs> on two topics where, if you like, the blueprint is there waiting for implementation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adam Alekun, for joining us on The Morning Show. Thank you very much. Thank you.